Thank you, Dr. Tang and colleagues. I'm very pleased to speak with you today about new treatments in tuberculosis. If I'd been speaking to you five years ago, this would be a very short talk. However, recently there are many new trials which have become available to us. And there are many new regimens which we can start to adopt in our clinical practice in Vietnam and other countries around the world to treat TB and both drug susceptible TB and drug resistant TB. During the talk this afternoon, I'm going to talk about how we might choose an optimal regimen for patients with TB. I'll briefly talk about what existing regimens we use and then give you an overview of some of the recent clinical trials that give us options for shorter treatment for both drug susceptible and drug resistant TB. I'll make some brief comments about the new WHO guidelines and recent rapid updates and then talk about what future research uh, we need to do to try and improve patient outcomes. Professor Marks, I think, has given you a very clear picture of the scale of the problem of tuberculosis around the world. Over 10 million people globally, 1.6 million deaths each year, and for the first time in 20 years, TB incidence has risen. We know that many countries are still struggling with the, the burden of tuberculosis, even though we've had effective treatment available to us for uh, more than 30 years. So the question is, what can we do to improve the standard of TB treatment? I think for too long we've accepted the treatment that we use as being the best that we can have. But unfortunately, the treatments that we use for TB, the standard six-month course of four drugs, is actually not the best regimen we can give our patients. It's often highly toxic. Often patients stop taking the therapy because of intolerance or because of the duration of therapy. And so therefore it's important for us to think about how we can provide better treatments for our patients. I think our colleagues in the HIV community have really led the way here by giving an example of what we can do. These days, if you have HIV, you can take a single tablet once a day and that can uh, be minimally uh, so toxic and it can allow you to go and lead a normal life. Yet, in TB, we haven't really had many drugs that get us even close to that standard. So you can see here some of the characteristics of the ideal regimens that we want for tuberculosis. They need to be effective to achieve sustained cure. They need to have minimal toxicity. They need to be as short as possible in order to go and achieve that sustained cure. They need to be affordable. They need to be easy to take, so ideally oral and not including injectable medicines. And they need to have minimal drug interactions with other medicines that the patients may be taking who have TB. The problem is, how do we decide which of these features to prioritise? We might have a regimen which is very short, but if it's also got a lot of side effects, then maybe it's not as good as a, a treatment which is longer and has less side effects. I show you here a list of some of the drugs that we use to treat TB. Most of these drugs have been around for 30 or more years. And some of them, such as pyrazinamide, probably wouldn't be registered if it was um, involved in clinical trials today because of its severe hepatotoxicity. And we're very familiar with many of the first-line drugs. We're fortunate that in the last decade, we've had a number of new and repurposed drugs available for drug-resistant TB, particularly bedaquiline, which has actually turned out to be quite well tolerated in most patients and linezolid, which is a repurposed drug that was used previously for other infections, but unfortunately does have considerable toxicity. So the standard regimens which we have been using to treat tuberculosis are shown here. And you can see the current WHO recommendations according to the guidelines that were released back in um, 2022. Um, you can see that there um, are, first of all, the standard four, uh, sorry, two months um, four drug and then four months two drug regimen that we use commonly in many countries. And I know in Vietnam you also add a thambutol to that because of the 
high prevalence of isoniazid resistance. Um, but in fact, um, there's also evidence uh, for a shorter four-month regimen, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that includes two months of four drugs followed by two months of two drugs. And this is based upon evidence in people who are over 12 years old um, and uh, it is for people who have more um, mild drug susceptible disease. So let's start to talk about some of these new regimens. First of all, beginning with this four month regimen for treating drug susceptible TB. So this is a regimen which was actually a part of a study called Study 31 and Vietnam was a part of this study. Um, the study was conducted amongst people who are 12 years or older and were TB culture confirmed with susceptibility to first line drugs and to fluoroquinolones and had smear positive or PCR positive tuberculosis. So this is many of the patients that we treat. The intervention in this trial comprised two months of four drugs, that is isoniazid, um, rifapentine, pyrazinamide and ethambutol, followed by two months of isoniazid and rifapentine. Rifapentine is an antibiotic that is in the same category, the same drug class as rifampicin, it's a rifamycin antibiotic, and has a longer half-life. And um, it's uh, been shown to be very well tolerated uh, particularly if given daily. This was a phase three non-inferiority trial. What that meant is that the standard six-month regimen was compared to the shorter four-month regimen and the researchers looked to see whether it was any worse. Uh, in other words, whether it was non-inferior. The comparator was daily therapy with two and then four uh, months of four drugs and two drugs respectively. The outcome of this trial was survival free, survival free relapse, sorry, survival free um, cure of tuberculosis um, 12 months after randomization. And there were secondary outcomes looking at longer term um, disease free survival as well as a safety analysis looking at grade three to five adverse events. And you can see um, that uh, the non inferiority margin was 6.6%. That meant that the study was looking to see, is the new regimen less than 6.6% worse than the current regimen? You can see here on the slide from the results of the, the paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, there was a diversity of populations involved and uh, this is a study that's relevant to Vietnam. You can see that overall about 11% of participants were from Asian descent. Um, and around 8% had HIV, so it's generalizable to the population with HIV as well. You can also see that the vast majority of patients had high smear grades of grade of 2 plus or 3 plus, indicating more extensive disease. So this is generally applicable to our patients that we tend to see in, uh, in hospitals in, uh, in Vietnam or in Australia. So you can see um, in terms of the um, the results here, if you look at the slide, that it shows that in fact the study 31 regimen was equivalent to the six month regimen. So that tells us that it is uh, within that 6.6% margin um, considered to be non-inferior. And so the, um, the arm that was, that was shown to be non-inferior was the rifapentine um, moxifloxacin arm. There was another arm that I didn't mention that didn't include moxifloxacin, and that arm um, did not meet the non-inferiority criteria. Um, you can see that, uh, in fact, there was an overlap of the um, confidence limits for non-inferiority for microbiologically eligible individuals and assessable individuals. So on the basis of this data, WHO has recommended the use of a four-month regimen as an alternative to the six-month standard regimen. So this is really the first time in many decades that we finally have a shorter regimen for our patients who have drug susceptible tuberculosis. And I think the Vietnam National Tuberculosis Program can be proud to have participated in this study. So in addition to adults 
There's also been a study performed recently looking at children and to see whether there's um, an effective shorter regimen. This uh, is called the SHINE trial, and it was a study that was uh, looking at under 16-year-old children who had non-severe symptomatic disease, which was presumed to be drug susceptible, um, and smear negative on a respiratory sample. We know that children often cannot produce sputum, and therefore we can often not perform drug susceptibility testing for children, uh, and also the interpretation of smear is different in children. We can't necessarily assume just because they have no sputum that they are going to be smear negative. So this trial was a very pragmatic trial, and it sought to compare a two-month regimen of two to three drugs, that is, isoniazid, rifampicin, and pyrazinamide, plus or minus a thambutol, according to local practice, followed by two months of isoniazid and rifampicin. And uh, you can see that the standard of care was the standard two months of four drugs followed by four months of two drugs. This trial looked at, uh, as a primary outcome, the unfavorable status by 72 weeks. Um, and the primary safety analysis was done looking at grade three to five adverse events. Just like the previous trial, this was also a non-inferiority trial. It was asking the question, is this regimen um, no worse than the standard of care? and there was a non-inferiority margin of 6%, which is similar to the um, study 31. Okay. And so you can see here the results of the study. Um, so amongst the cohort that was recruited, 14% had confirmed culture for MTB on either a culture or had a positive gene expert. And in fact, those who had a positive expert had low or very low um, CT values, which indicated that there was likely to be a low burden of disease in these individuals. The study had very good retention in care of 95% at 72 weeks. And you can see that the median age of these children overall was about 3.5 years, and uh, they were included uh, children in Uganda, Zambia, South Africa, and India. So there were not any Asian sites, uh, any Southeast Asian sites involved in this study and 11% of the population had HIV. So if you look at the uh, figure shown here, it shows you um, uh, the outcomes. And you can see uh, on the right-hand side, it shows the risk difference comparing the new regimen to the standard of care regimen. And the boxes show the point estimate and the bars around show the um, confidence limits. And so you can see here that in fact, the shorter regimen was non-inferior, so that, that is, it was no worse. And uh, there was no difference in uh, both this analysis and the time to event analysis, the hazard ratio being 0.88 with confidence limits crossing the null. So again, this shows us that the SHINE regimen was effective uh, and in this population um, is likely to be you know, a suitable choice. It was also very well tolerated. In fact, kids, as you would know, tolerate TB regimens very well, um, that there were only a small number of grade three or four drug reactions considered to be possibly or probably related to the drugs, and 11 of those were hepatic events. So there's a very small proportion of toxicity, and only two children stopped treatment due to adverse drug reactions. So what does this mean for our practice then? Well, first of all, it means that WHO now recommends a four-month regimen for selected populations. That is, people who are 12 years and older with drug-susceptible pulmonary TB or for children from three months to 16 years old with non-severe TB. And there are different regimens according to those two trials that are recommended. And we know that people with HIV should um, be treated in the same way as people uh, who have HIV. So this is really exciting news. And um, the national guidelines of many countries are like to likely to change in response to this. Um, there are still some issues in relation to using rifapentine. So at the moment, commercially available rifapentine dosing requires quite a large number of tablets. And so we're hoping that there'll be uh, either higher dose tablets or potentially combination regimens uh, that may be available in the future to allow this to be scaled up. So 
I'm just going to briefly, uh, in the final few minutes, talk about drug-resistant TB. Um, drug-resistant TB um, is a bit like a pyramid. There's quite a few people who have resistance to one drug. And as you go up the pyramid, you see that multi-drug-resistant TB um, is less common. Uh, in uh, most parts of the world, uh, it's less than 5% prevalence. And then extensively drug-resistant TB uh, is very uncommon. Um, ex uh, just for, uh, for way of definition, um, rifampicin resistance, which is what we detect using GeneXpert, and multidrug resistant TB are grouped together in many of these trials for practical reasons in terms of how patients are diagnosed. We know that Vietnam is both a high prevalence country for TB as well as for multidrug resistant TB, um, and so therefore trials which are developing new, better regimens for multidrug resistant TB are important for Vietnam. We know that acquired drug resistance can occur when patients take inadequate therapy or interrupted therapy. And so uh, in Vietnam, unfortunately, isoniazid resistance has become very common, most likely because of the regimens uh, that were used back in the 2000s that led to high rates of isoniazid resistance occurring. Um, one of the breakthroughs in TB about a decade ago was the development of rapid uh, molecular diagnostics. And the gene expert machine can not only detect resistance to rifampicin, but there are new generation cartridges that also allow detection to second line drugs, uh, including fluoroquinolones and also resistance to isoniazid. The advantage of these rapid tests is that they allow us to start patients on appropriate treatment at the time that they are initially diagnosed, rather than having to wait at least uh, four to six weeks until the culture and uh, the culture-based drug susceptibility is available. And as I mentioned, there are now new expert, expert cartridges which are quite um, uh, uh, comparable to the performance of the first-line gene expert, um, being highly sensitive um, and having a specificity of almost 100%. So these um, cartridges can be used to guide therapy. Now, the regimens that have been recommended by WHO for treating drug-resistant TB have been gradually changing over recent years. For isoniazid resistant tuberculosis, there's a lack of clinical trial evidence, uh, but the current recommendation for WHO is a six-month course that includes a fluoroquinolone in place of isoniazid. There are other guidelines um, internationally which also um, allow for a longer course of treatment uh, with, um, without the fluoroquinolone. For treatment of multidrug or rifampicin resistant tuberculosis, there has been um, a rapid flurry of trial data that, that has been coming out over the last couple of years that is set to accelerate with the publication of another study uh, and the announcement of the results of the STREAM2 trial um, in the near future. So the good news about rifampicin resistant TB is that no longer is the traditional um, 18 to 24 month regimen required, but there are alternatives that are available now, and I'll talk about those in a second. But the current WHO standard of care up until uh, recently has been the use of three so-called group A drugs plus one group B drug, uh, which is over a course of six months, and then followed typically by another nine to 12 months of um, three group A drugs plus or minus additional drugs. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the details of multidrug resistant TB treatment, but just to say that these regimens have been developed based upon um, a number of um, observational studies, and until now we haven't had good clinical trial data to inform those. There's been um, a number of high profile um, publications looking at much shorter regimens recently. One of these is the NICS study. This was a single arm um, open label study which uh, did not have a comparator group included in the, uh, in the trial itself, um, using a combination of three drugs, vidaquiline, protominid, and linezolid, for 24 weeks. The dose of linezolid was 1,200 milligrams daily, which is a high dose, and the outcome uh, in the study um, over, um, over a, um, uh, in the study was um, unfavorable outcomes, including failure and disease relapse. Uh, so instead of looking at favourable, it looks at the inverse, unfavourable outcomes. This was a study that included 109 participants and was conducted in South Africa. Um, and it included people who had 
more advanced drug resistance, so XDR-TB or MDR-TB that had not been responsive to treatment. So these are the sicker patients for whom we didn't have very good uh, regimens available previously. Um, this study um, demonstrated that by using this particular regimen, there was a 90% favourable or 10% unfavourable outcome in the intention to treat population. So that indicates that this is much better than the traditional 50% to 70% outcomes that have been achieved for multi-drug resistant TB and, and considerably better than the long-standing treatment for extensively drug resistant TB or treatment um, uh, failure with MDR-TB. So this was very promising but it was not yet a randomised trial. One of the disadvantages of this approach is that there is a high rate of adverse events of 62%. And so this indicated that particularly due to the linezolid, we may need to have some alternative dosing. Following from the Xenix study, the same group, the TB Alliance, performed the Xenix study, which this time was a randomised trial, but again did not have a comparator group that reflected the standard of care. It included four arms with different doses and different durations of linezolid, reflecting the importance of trying to minimise toxicity. And so there were four arms for 24 weeks, each receiving BPAL, bedaquiline, protominid, and linezolid. And um, the outcomes were similar to those in the, in the NICS study that I'd mentioned previously. Um, and as I mentioned, there was no standard of care regimen, um, but there were four different intervention arms. Um, and so the results of the Xenix study demonstrated that at the um, higher dose, that 93% had a successful outcome, and at the lower doses, uh, which was 600 milligrams for 26 weeks, 91% um, had a successful outcome. Uh, and the other two arms were similar. So in other words, more than 90% treatment success with this regimen. There were, however, very high rates of peripheral neuropathy, with 38% in the um, 1200 milligram 26 week group and 24% in both the 1200 milligram nine, nine week group and the, 24 and the uh, 600 milligram 26 week, week group of linezolid. So this indicates that this regimen, whilst it is effective, still is not perfect and still is associated with considerable toxicity. And so when it comes to scaling up this regimen, it's going to be important to have effective programmatic monitoring for drug toxicity. So there was a trial that only came out a couple of weeks ago, which is another um, bow in the, um, in the quiver of the um, MDR community, the MDIN trial. This was conducted in South Korea and used a delaminid-based regimen, extending therapy from nine months, which was the standard um, uh, delaminid plus linezolid plus levofloxacin uh, with pyrazinamide, extending that nine-month regimen up to 12 months if the culture um, didn't convert until after three months. And the comparator group here was the WHO 2014 regimen. It's always a, tr a challenge with MDR trials because they take so long to complete, the standard of care can sometimes change during the trial, and that's what happened here. And so, um, so the, c the trial is not directly comparable to our current standard of care. Nevertheless, this non-inferiority trial did show that the shorter regimen, the nine-month delaminate-containing regimen, was non-inferior to the WHO standard at the time that the trial started. And so therefore, this is another option that we might consider. The final study, which has been reported uh, but not published yet, has been the TB Practical trial. This was conducted by MSF and partners, and it included um, people who are aged 18 and over with microbiologically confirmed uh, TB, which had rifampin resistance. Um, it had four arms, uh, the B-PALM, so that is the vidaculone, protominid linezolid, plus moxifloxacin, as well as one where the moxifloxacin was replaced with clofazamine, one without either moxifloxacin or clofazamine, and then um, there was a standard comparator arm, which is the standard of care. The practical trial comparator did change during the trial and did vary between sites, and so there was not one single standard of care against which to compare. The results have been presented at a union conference last year and a number of other meetings, um, and it showed that there was um, only 11.3% unsuccessful outcomes with BPALM compared to 48.5% with the standard of care. So in other words, it was substantially um, better uh, than the standard of care regimens. Um, the trial was stopped early because of an interim analysis and uh, the interim analysis um, showed that the BPALM regimen seemed to be the most um, efficacious 
Um, and so uh, that was the, uh, the one that has been taken up as the recommendation by WHO. Um, and there'll be more to uh, report on these studies as their publications are uh, in press, and I understand um, it should be published soon. So just in summary then, the WHO now has uh, an increasing number of alternatives available for treatment of MDR-TB. Um, for um, uh, MDR-TB, the standard um, 18 to 24 month regimen still remains a standard of care, uh, but we now have also um, a nine month regimen uh, based upon the uh, data which I referred to previously from previous um, uh, observational studies and from South African data. And then now we have this exciting six month regimen, which um, the current recommendation is for B-PALM, that is Bidaquilin, Protominid, Linezolid and Moxifloxacin. And the Moxifloxacin can be dropped in the case of somebody who has um, fluoroquinolone resistant disease. So this I think will be um, greatly appreciated by patients who can have much shorter treatment. And uh, so long as they can be tolerated, um, it achieves um, high treatment success rates. So that really brings us to um, what next? Well, there are many trials that are in the pipeline that I think will fill further gaps. The STREAM2 trial will have its results reported next week at the union meeting, and I'd encourage you to attend that. Um, and there's much more research uh, that is required to optimise the uh, management of toxicity in these regimens and to try and find alternatives, particularly to linezolid, uh, where there is still considerable toxicity. So in conclusion, there has been a, a great flurry of new evidence available for us in treating drug susceptible and drug resistant TB. There are more trials that are also on the horizon. Um, here in Vietnam, uh, we're about to start a clinical trial looking at um, a new regimen to treat isoniazid resistant TB, which is very exciting, working with the National Tuberculosis Program. Uh, and there are other trials um, planned uh, for multi-drug resistant TB, which, uh, which you can find uh, online as well that are at different stages, which I, I'm not going through today. So thank you for the opportunity to present and I'd be very happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. À dạ em xin có cái câu hỏi hai câu hỏi về cái nghiên cứu à không phải cái nghiên cứu mà là cái báo cáo về sau của thầy về cái phác đồ điều trị lao ngắn ngày á thì 4 tháng đối với những bệnh nhân mà à trên cơ điều suy giảm miễn dịch chẳng hạn thì ví dụ đại đường hoặc là dùng cọc tiêu ít dai ngay chẳng hạn thì cái phác điều trị trị lao 4 tháng nó có hiệu quả hay không? Và câu hỏi thứ hai là Uh, với những cái uh, trên cái thế giới thì đã có những cái nghiên cứu uh, trên những cái đối tượng uh, bệnh nhân như thế này hay chưa ạ? Yeah, xin cảm ơn ạ. Thank you, thank you very much for your question. Um, so as I mentioned, there is um, a substantial um, population of people with HIV who were included in study 31, and so therefore I think it is generalizable to that population. Um, you might recall that I mentioned that there are 11 percent. Um, sorry, 8% of people with HIV um, uh, among the st study population. Um, the median body weight of the population was 53 kilos, um, but I don't have any data about what proportion were overweight, um, but I think that it would be applicable um, to people in, um, in Vietnam. The um, median body mass index was 18.9 and ranged from 12.8 up to 45.2. So it did include people who were underweight and also significantly overweight. So I think we can apply this regimen to many different populations. Um, thank you, Professor Gray Marx and Grace Falk with a very excellent uh, presentation today. And I have a question for Professor Gray Marx is that, uh, so could you please give us the advice in order to end TB in Vietnam uh, in uh, 2035, like uh, you uh, mentioned in your presentation. Please, thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that question. I didn't ask you to ask the question, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> because it's a very good question. And, and, and I, I think what needs to be done is that there are 64 provinces in, in, I understand, in, uh, in Vietnam. And I don't think you can tomorrow start doing this in all 100 million people in Vietnam in 64 provinces. But I think you can start within the next year or two. Uh, 
uh, by 2024, you should start by demonstrating this in at least two or three high burden provinces in Vietnam. Probably not Ho Chi Minh City, because there's so many people moving in and out of Ho Chi Minh City, it would not be a good place to start. You need to do it in a place where there is not a lot of movement. And I would choose some high burden uh, cities. In fact, one place that would be good would be not far from here. We've considered, you know, Haiphong, for example, would be a good place to start. But also Anjang, Kanto, uh, you know, fairly high burden and isolated uh, district uh, provinces where you would try and implement the program that I described uh, of active case finding using the whole population and making sure that you linked everybody into care so that you made sure that everybody got who you found got treatment and completed treatment. So it's not just a matter of finding all the cases. It's not just a matter of active case finding. It's a matter of having a very good treatment program in place as well. And also of having the population on side so that people understand why we're doing this. Why are we screening everybody? Why are we testing everybody? So I think you do that and you demonstrate it and you get um, support for it. In fact, we had a lot of support in Kamau for what we were doing and people, uh, th there was a lot of uh, positive feedback about what we were doing. And once you do that, other places want to do it. <laughs> uh, and so you start somewhere and you build momentum. And my feeling is you start in two or three provinces and then you, over a period of a few years, you expand to the whole country. And it's, it's doable. It, you know, you probably do need some support from Global Fund and maybe from, uh, from banks, from the World Bank, Asia Development Bank and so on, loans. But it is doable. Uh, and you, the benefit will be you will not be dealing with TB in 10 years' time. You know, you can say that in 10 years' time, TB is no longer a big problem in Vietnam. Um, so that's what I think you can be done here. Thank you. I, I think it depends on uh, cost, it depends the money from uh, the World Bank for the, the active uh, fighting TB in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, chúng ta còn rất nhiều việc phải làm uh, để cho uh, có thể áp dụng được các cái kỹ thuật uh, chẩn đoán uh, chủ động uh, như uh, Professor Gai Mark uh, uh, có một cái nghiên cứu rất là có hiệu quả ở, ở Cà Mau. Uh, tôi nghĩ rằng là các bạn còn ý kiến nữa nhưng mà tôi rất phải xin lỗi bởi vì tôi mới nhận được một cái tin nhắn là uh, hội trường này phải kết thúc để quay trở về hội trường ở trên để họp ban chấp hành. Cho nên rằng là các bạn hết sức là thông cảm. Mặc dù là cái nội dung ngày hôm nay rất là, là, là thú vị và rất là thực tế. Tôi cũng xin summarize, xin tóm tắt lại là chiều nay chúng ta nghe một cái báo cáo về viêm phổi cộng đồng. Và có những cái hướng dẫn tôi nghĩ rằng là rất là thực tế đối với thực hành chúng ta. Chúng ta nghe một cái báo cáo về dị ứng uh, thuốc và chúng ta cũng nghĩ rằng là chúng ta cũng sẽ phải nhờ cậy các bác sĩ chuyên khoa dị ứng hỗ trợ chúng ta trong một số trường hợp. Thí dụ như chúng ta hết sự lựa chọn trong vấn đề sử dụng kháng sinh. Và chúng ta được nghe hai cái báo cáo về lao cũng rất là thú vị. Và tôi nghĩ là đối với những người làm lao thì đây cũng là những cái thông tin khá mới vì tôi biết là cái phát đầu điều trị mới này là phát đầu điều trị cũng chưa được áp dụng một cách đại trà trên quốc gia của mình. Và vấn đề thứ hai là vấn đề trần đoán phát hiện chủ động lao ở trong cộng đồng như là giáo sư Gai Mạc trình bày. Tất nhiên là chúng ta cũng chỉ là có một cái mô hình có tính chất là pilot thôi chúng ta còn phụ thuộc rất nhiều vấn đề kinh phí nữa. Cho phép tôi thay mặt chủ tọa đoàn, thay, thay mặt uh, Professor Gai Mark, uh, xin được uh, dừng cái session này ở đây. Uh, rất là cảm ơn các báo cáo viên, uh, uh, giáo sư uh, Ray Fox và giáo sư Gai Mark. Uh, không biết là ban chủ tọa có đề xuất gì không? Uh, xin phép uh, cảm ơn uh, dừng hội nghị ở đây. <cười>